order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls, a war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs, a war on birds, and a war on beasts, they got a war on hippies. Hi, I'm Liz Reese, and welcome to Voices of Resistance. Today's program is entitled, No to Endless Wars for Empire. Now, many people have the impression that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have ended, when in fact, these wars are ongoing and far from over. The Afghanistan war recently returned to the headlines when the U.S. bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital in the Kunduz province in Afghanistan. That's right, we bombed a hospital. 22 people were killed during this attack. 12 of those people were hospital staff members with Doctors Without Borders, and there were 10 patients, three of which were children. Another 37 people were injured. This attack constitutes a grave violation of international humanitarian law. The clinic's GPS coordinates were well known to the U.S. government and the U.S. military, and clinic personnel were frantically calling Kabul and Washington, D.C. when the bombing started, which continued for at least an hour. Initially, the U.S. dismissed this, this massacre as collateral damage until worldwide outcries forced President Obama to personally apologize. To date, the U.S. still refuses to sign off on a truly independent investigation and insists that it can investigate itself. Now, of course, Doctors Without Borders is demanding, which they should, an independent investigation because you really can't trust the people who bombed the hospital to carry out a thorough investigation, can you? Also in the news recently regarding Afghanistan, documents detailing a special operations campaign in northeastern Afghanistan, which is referred to as Operation Haymaker, show that between January 2012 and February 2013, U.S. special operations airstrikes killed more than 200 people. Of those, only 35 were the intended targets. Now, think about this for a minute. This has to do with the drone strikes, and it's talking about how many people. In that short amount of time, that one-year period, 200 people were targeted and killed, yet 35 of those people were really only the targets. During one five-month period of the operation, according to these documents, nearly 90% of the people killed in airstrikes were not the intended targets. These documents came from an unnamed whistleblower within the intelligence community who The Intercept says was moved to publish them out of concerns over the morality of the drone program at large. So I've talked a lot about drone assassinations and drone killings and what this whole drone program and Obama known as the drone president means for humanity and the people living in these areas. And, you know, unfortunately, this document that was leaked out comes as absolutely no surprise to me at all. Um, I'm not shocked at all that 90% of the people killed in recent drone strikes in Afghanistan were not the intended targets of the attacks. So this is just one more reminder of why people need to speak out and demand justice both in having troops and bombs and also drone attacks. So it is now 14 years since the U.S. first attacked and invaded Afghanistan, one of the poorest countries in the world. Even by official U.S. estimates, around 30,000 Afghan civilians have been killed. Hundreds of thousands have been driven from their homes by bombing, drone attacks, night raids, and special forces operations. And what little infrastructure existed has been devastated in region after region, 
resulting in rampant child malnutrition and one of the world's highest rates of mortality in childbirth. This is the war that candidate Obama called the good war when he ran for president in 2008. President Obama recently announced that he will cease U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. No surprise there, even though people still like to claim the war is over and it's ended and we're getting those troops out. So Obama said no, <laughs> and the troop levels will remain at somewhere near 10,000 through the end of Obama's term in office. This war and occupation has never been about protecting the American people or about freeing Afghanistan from the feudal Taliban. It has always been about securing and expanding U.S. empire. And it will not en end until mass determined political resistance is mobilized in this country that faces up to the reality of this deadly enterprise and rejects the presumption that American lives matter more than any other lives. So, since I thought it was important to remind people that this war is ongoing and continues, I wanted to show you a couple of clips from some really good speakers. Now, the first one I'm going to show you in a little bit is actually from a conference that took place in March of this year, March 18th through the 21st of 2015. But it was a really amazing conference, and I've done so many other shows about police brutality and the police terror and people rising up about that and also the attacks on women's reproductive freedom and choice. Um, but I thought it was important to talk about the war again. So the first clip I'm going to show you is just of a very couple minutes um, clip kind of advertising for this Spring Rising Conference. And I wanted to show it because I think it's important to remember that there are still a lot of groups out there that are resisting, that are speaking out about the war, that are exposing on a regular basis the war crimes, the atrocities, how it affects the people living in those communities. So you're going to see a couple minutes about Spring Rising, which was an anti-war intervention that took place in March of 2015 in Washington, D.C. It was on the 12th anniversary of the shock and awe, as the U.S. named it, shock and awe invasion of Iraq. And after that, you're going to see a speaker named Raed Jarrar, who is a really good speaker. He's a policy impact coordinator at the American Friends Service Committee. So check these out, and I'll be back.
I'd like to invite Ra'ed Jarrar uh, to be next. Ra'ed works here in D.C. for the American Friends Service Committee, and I know that I first learned about him when he was pulled off the JetBlue flight wearing the t-shirt in Arabic that said, we will not be silent. And because he fought that, and he was vocal about it, and he won, uh, we know about him today. Thank you, everyone. I see someone wearing the t-shirt in the back. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't my first uh, encounter with the U.S. government. Uh, I had uh, a few other encounters before that, including a U.S. tank that uh, ran down my street in Baghdad uh, 12 years ago. Um, I was actually living in Iraq um, during the 90s. I was born there. I'm half Iraqi and half Palestinian. I'm half Sunni and half Shiite. Or as you, they call us in Iraq, sushis. <laughs> um, I have a lot of halves and halves in my family. Um, and we, we lived, you know, on and off in, in Iraq and uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and other parts of the region. Uh, but I was in Baghdad 12 years ago. And I always remember that, you know, the shock and awe. How awful it was. How shocking it was. You know, the other day I was remembering my mother, who's a, a friend of Cindy's. Um, she's, a, she's a civil engineer. Uh, that's how my parents met. They met at school. Uh, and my mother is a, is a very um, empowered woman. Uh, she's a feminist uh, who, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, got in fights with men when they um, stood up in the bus to give, give her uh, their seat. Because <laughs> men and women are equal, so <laughs> you give your seat. <laughs> but um, this civil engineer that built many homes and schools and, and uh, hospitals around the region, I always remember this one scene uh, during shock and awe. The five of us, my parents and myself and my two siblings, were uh, all hiding in one of the bedrooms on the ground floor. And it's terrifying. It's terrifying even for us, a generation that uh, grew up in Iraq lived through so many wars, because, because shock and awe wasn't the first time that Iraq was bombed by the U.S. The U.S. has been bombing Iraq since January of 1991. It's been 24 years of bombardment, more or less the same policies. But even with that, even with all the experience that we had, it was really shocking. So I remember my mom, we were in the safe room in the, in the control, and the house is shaking and dust is coming out of the walls every time a missile falls in our neighborhood. And she put the sheets on her head. She was so scared that she hid under the sheets. It just breaks my heart. To think that this civil engineer who knows exactly how strong uh, a reinforced concrete ceiling can hold is so terrified that she would hide under the cover. That is the terror, the terror that the U.S. has put the Iraqis through. And that wasn't the worst of it. We, we are among the lucky ones. We, uh, we got... Uh, a few near misses. Uh, I was kidnapped once. My, my brother was kidnapped and uh, kept in the dungeon of the um, Ministry of uh, Interior. Um, my mother was um, hijacked. Her car was, was hijacked and they almost uh, shot her. But none of us died. And we all left the country. 
I was earlier speaking to one of the, uh, my friends outside, and she asked me, how is your family in, in Iraq? Are, are they okay? And I said, I don't have family in Iraq. I was born in that country. I had almost every single person who I knew in my entire life living within a 30-minute drive from our home in Baghdad. But a few years after the invasion, they're all either dead or they have left. Uh, because five million Iraqis had to leave uh, their homes in the last, uh, in the last uh, decade or so. I'll speak just for a few minutes uh, about the situation. And uh, let me start by, by, by reiterating what, what was said earlier about this notion that what's going on in Iraq or elsewhere uh, happens because of mistakes. Mm -hmm. like, Oops! Oh, we destroyed another country. Whoops! This is a bad policy, you know? And we are told that there are bad policies and mistakes that have caused death and destruction and chaos in Iraq. I don't think so. I don't think so, because, because when you look back at the last 24 years, there is a plan. It's a very consistent policy. President Obama is the fourth consecutive U.S. president to declare war on Iraq. That's right. And we've been doing exactly the same for 24 years. We have been destroying that country for exactly the same way. That's for dramatic effect. <laughs> Ten, I should have said, we have been turning off the lights. <laughs> the same idea. So, like, imagine, like, the, the, the attack is against Iraq. How do you attack a nation? Think about it. How do you destroy a country? Is it really by bombing the, the government? Eh, maybe that would destroy the government. But how do you, how do you destroy a nation? such a hard question, right? I, I've never really thought about it before seeing what happened in Iraq, because Iraq as a nation was destroyed. There was a plan, and this plan has costed us in the U.S., taxpayers, trillions of dollars. It has costed Iraqis trillions of more dollars. There's a plan that someone is paying for it to destroy the national identity of Iraq the territorial integrity of Iraq, the demographic overlap of Iraq. These things, you know, these, we're talking about things that are way, way harder and, and more complicated <coughs> than us to explain one United Nation where people live together. And then someone said, huh, why don't we divide that nation into three or four more enclaves that are sectarian and ethnic? rather than having it as one United Nation. This is equivalent to someone coming to the U.S. and saying, let's cut the, the U.S. to three nations. One black nation, and one white nation, and one Hispanic nation. It's actually worse than that. Because in the U.S., there are real divisions. And different roots between African Americans and white Americans and people of, uh, you know, brown people. Uh, I was told I was a, a brown person when I landed in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Iraqi Sunnis and Iraqi Shiites existed in the same territories for thousands of years. Like, no, no one abducted the ancestors of the other people and ship them from another continent, you know. No one invaded the other persons. These are people who are living in that case. So I'm saying the divisions are even crazier than saying let's create different nations in the U.S. But in the U.S., imagine the destruction that would fall on this nation if we wanted to displace every non-African American from the South every non-white from the Northeast, and every non-brown person from the West. 
Imagine how people will lose their homes, how many people will be killed, how many people will be traumatized. This is what happened in Iraq. And in 2003, when, when this announced plan of dividing Iraq into, into three or four nations became public, I said, this is a crazy idea. I said, that would never happen. There are millions of non-Shiites who are living in the South, millions of non-Sunnis. Uh, the country is very mixed. And there are a bunch of sushis as well around the country. It's not easy to divide it. So the last 13 years, there has been the largest ethnic and sectarian cleansing campaign in the history of the region since the creation of Israel in 1948. The most systematic, the most, um, the most uh, planned, uh, effort to displace people based on their ethnicity and sectarian affiliation. So a few years into the invasion, we reached a place where the demographics of Iraq were shifted so much that implementing the plan of dividing the country became more possible. I want to show you a uh, Two, two recent reports, and uh, I will end my, my remarks on, on that. Uh, two very recent reports that came uh, became public this week. Um, one of them is a, is a Human Rights Watch report about Iraq. And uh, this Human Rights Watch report focuses on ISIS, usually, but this time focuses on the uh, crimes of the Iraqi government and the Shiite militias affiliated with the Iraqi government. So, uh, there was a town called Amirli in the northeast of Iraq that was controlled by this thing called ISIS. A very convenient thing that showed up out of nowhere took over six provinces in Iraq in a couple of days, 5,000 men in pickup trucks <coughs> took over six provinces, 33% of the territory of the country, that has spent tens of billions of dollars on buying weapons without really firing so many bullets, actually. It's a very, very convenient uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So ISIS came and filled this void. There was a void in these six provinces in the last 13 years for a separatist Sunni group. There was no separatist Sunni groups. There are separatist Shiite groups in the south of Iraq, um, and they want to create a Shia stan around here, right? So this area, there are many separatist Shiite groups. In the north of Iraq, there are many separatist Kurdish groups. In the middle and west of Iraq, there were no separatist Sunni groups until June of last year. This group pops up and it says, we are a Sunni group and we want to create a state separate than the rest of us. So, I'll talk a little bit about, about ISIS in a second, but so Amirli was an area that uh, is referred to as uh, disputed territory, when the Iraqi Kurdish and Shiite uh, forces decided to separate the country, they, they put a, an imaginary line and they said, this should be Kurdistan, this should be Shiistan, this should, should be Sunnistan. There are some areas between Sunnistan and Shiistan and Kurdistan, they, they call them disputed territories. No one uh, controls it. The Amity falls within a disputed territory. So it was controlled by ISIS for a few weeks. Then it was, quote-unquote, liberated by the Iraqi government and Shiite militias. Now, these Iraqi government and militias forces are funded and trained by us. Uh, we, they are equipped by us. Uh, Kurdish militias are funded and equipped by us. And we are also dropping bombs from the sky uh, to support them. So these red, red dots around the Amirli are the towns that were, uh, every black dot is the towns that, that the U.S. bombed. And every red, red circle 
is uh, the, uh, the level of uh, ethnic cleansing that happened after these uh, groups kicked ISIS out. I want to show you um, the inside the report there's one image that I want to share and then I'll move on. The reason why I'm showing this, and, and you guys should read the report and, and check it out, it's on HRW's website. Um, the reason why I'm showing it is that this is a very small um, story. It's a very small portion of the story. It's one town. But we, what you can see in this is that there is a systemic effort in ethnic cleansing inside Iraq that is led by parties that are funded and trained by the United States. It's not, it's not that crazy violence that's just going because of no reason. There is a systemic plan going behind it. I wanted to look at this map. This is a village. After ISIS left the village, the Iraqi forces went inside and they burned every single house for Sunni Arabs. <coughs> the red dots are houses that were burned by arson, by gasoline. Look at the effort. This is not crazy violence. Someone has a list of houses. This is a very systemic plan. We know exactly what we're doing there. There is a systemic ethnic cleansing uh, plan that's going on. And the, the, so if you look at the larger picture of, of this report and other reports, ISIS is giving this amazing opportunity for us to complete our declared policy of dividing Iraq into three or more regions. So there is, it, maybe it's, there is some inconvenience that happened through the creation and, and the existence of ISIS, but it's actually very convenient to uh, many powers, including the Iraq government and the US and Iraq. The other report I want to mention, uh, and I mentioned this briefly to, um, to Cindy earlier, is, is a report that came out today by Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, it's the fourth report of its kind, the fourth or fifth, that confirms that the number of people who were killed in Iraq yeah. is five million. Uh, it, it, so it's 5% of the country, 1 million people were killed, 5 million people were displaced. 1 million human beings were killed since 2013. So I also encourage you to, to look at the report. It's, it has since um, since 2003. Okay. Uh, so the 1 million Iraqis were killed since the invasion, since 2003. Uh, and these are not deaths uh, that, you know, because of displacement, these are deaths because of violence and attacks and, and murder. So, before I stop, I just want to say that the narrative now in D.C. is that we have to continue bombing Iraq because there is another reason, right? There is ISIS, this bad guy that we have to step in and work with our good allies to save the day. Things on the ground are very different. There is strong evidence to suggest that, on the one hand, other groups, whether they are Shiite or Kurds or even Christian, the other militias are as bad as ISIS. We don't really hear about their crimes as much because they happen to be our friends. They're funded by our tax dollars money. Uh, and on, on the other hand, the premise that we can eliminate extremism through more violence, shouldn't have passed the leftist. So our, our premise now, the theme of engagement in Iraq is that we can bomb Iraq into moderation. There's extremism, we'll drop bombs and support sectarian militias, and then that will lead the country into moderation. That we can bomb Iraq into stability. That's the idea. And there is no evidence that that happened. We have been bombing Iraq since 1991. And the fact that Iraq is very unstable now is mostly due to all interventions. The fact that ISIS exists now is mostly due because to over intervention. And when you look at the root causes for why groups like ISIS exists, whether they are Sunni or Shiite, whether they are ISIS or Al-Qaeda, the root causes go back to the fact that there is a lack of a strong central government, there is a sectarian politics that were introduced in Iraq, and that uh, 
uh, people the, the national identity has been destroyed. And that's why we have symptoms of problem like ISIS. Let me stop here and we can maybe touch on some of the issues of, uh, regarding ISIS's uh, uh, roots and the ways to actually combat it in the question and answer. Thank you. So that was Raed Jarrar speaking at the Spring Rising in Anti-War Intervention, which took place in March of 2015 in Washington, D.C. And I thought he touched on so many really important topics, you know, talking about both after a 20-year, over 20-year period of war and occupation in Iraq, um, both the destruction and suffering of the people, displacement of people, and is it any wonder that things are so screwed up right now in that region? You know, he's talking about ISIS, and by any means I don't support ISIS, but, you know, the U.S. and other countries look on, we have to go get ISIS, we got to go get ISIS, what about those people over there? And he brings up really good points about how, you know, both sides, the sides that the U.S. is supporting, are, can be just as bad if not worse than ISIS, you know? So for the people living there, you know, there is no winner on both sides that the U.S. is supporting. I'd like to read a short sentence from Rev Revolution newspaper. The people of Afghanistan face a U.S.-backed regime of dark ages Islamic fundamentalist warlords who have aligned with the U.S. and on the other side, the oppressive Dark Ages Taliban, all of whom represent nothing but exploitation and oppression. And that's really the situation of what's happening. Now I want to show one more speaker. Um, his name is William Bloom. And the clip I'm going to show you actually took place at the Left Forum in 2015 in New York City on May 30th of this year. The theme for the whole Left Forum was Confronting the Crisis of Capitalism and Democracy. And the Left Forum in New York City involved 4,000 participants, um, over 1,300 speakers, and hundreds of panels, workshops, and events. World Can't Wait helped organize a panel entitled U.S. Wars of Aggression and Islamic Jihad. What is the bigger danger and how should the anti-war movement respond? That's a pretty provocative title if you ask me. Um, and there's three different speakers, but the one I'm going to show you is of William Bloom, who's an author, historian, a U.S. foreign policy critic. He left the State Department in 1967 abandoning his aspiration of becoming a Foreign Service officer because of his opposition to what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam. And Deborah Sweet with World Can't Wait will be introducing the speakers. And you can check out the entire event and all the speakers if you go to worldcantwait.net. You can see all of its entirety, but I'm just going to show you Deborah Sweet introducing William Bloom, and I'll be back to end the show. The legality and the morality of what the U.S. is doing in the world that um, we're going to continue in this panel. I'm Deborah Sweet. I'm the director of World Can't Wait. Um, we are very glad to have you all in the room. I think we're in the right place to dig in to a huge question right now, um, particularly if one lives in the Western world, um, our thoughts are being focused on the greatest danger to Western civilization or to the globe being um, ISIS in particular. And we're here to talk about what is the biggest danger and, and to look at both Islamic fundamentalism as a phenomenon, and very importantly, the, the history and practice of U.S. imperialism. And we have um, three panelists um, that we're very glad to introduce you to. We had a fourth, Ra'ed Jarrar, um, an Iraqi who was very compellingly able to speak at an earlier iteration of this program we did in March. Um, his wife is just about to give birth, so we, we gave him an out. 
Um, but you can also see that on video. And we will be putting all this together on worldcantwait.net, as well as all of these three speakers have their own websites, their own extensive writings. And I know you're here because you want to hear them. Um, and not particularly me, but I will say that World Can't Wait feels these conversations are extremely important. Yes, we protest in the streets whenever possible. Yes, we go into classes, but we bring people together to talk and dig into key questions of the day. Um, so welcome to U.S. Wars of Aggression and Islamic Jihad. What is the bigger danger? And how should the anti-war movement respond? We're going to have three presenters, and then we'll have a conversation. Our first presenter will be William Bloom, who is the editor and author of the Anti-Empire Report and a whole slew of books over the last 50 years, I would say, about US imperialism. Um, if you were to read those, you would get a very basic key important education about what the U.S. has done in the world. And I'll leave it at that because you will have him in person. Um, secondly, we're going to have Alan Goodman um, from the newspaper Revolution and the website Revcom.us, who's um, traveled to the Middle East and reported and written extensively um, with analysis about the two outmoded, the outmoded ruling strata from, um, of the Islamic fundamentalism and the definitely outmoded, seen its day, ruling U.S. imperialism. Um, and I think he'll be uh, using our projector. Third, uh, David Swanson, warisacrime.org. Um, I got to know him during the after Downing Street days in 2005, and he's been um, a force in the movement to stop war in the world, and in particular to stop what the U.S. has been doing around the world. He writes prodigiously several times a day. He answers email in about four seconds. And he's a great person to have as an advisor to World Can't Wait. So we'll go in that order. It'll be Bill, and then Alan, and then David. And we'll take questions and conversation afterwards. I'm not going to squash you if you want to make comments. You're welcome to make comments or ask questions. So let's get going. Bill. Thank you. Most of you, I'm sure, have met people who support U.S. foreign policy with whom you've argued and argued. You point out one horror after another from the, all the bombings and the invasions and the torture and, and and from, from Vietnam to Iraq, but nothing helps, nothing changes this person's mind. Uh, now why is that? Are these people just stupid? Uh, I think a better answer is that they have certain basic beliefs, certain uh, basic preconceptions, and if you, if you don't deal with those basic beliefs, you will not get anywhere with them. It's like talking to a stone wall. And what are, the, what, what are these basic beliefs? The most basic of them is a deeply held conviction that no matter what the U.S. government does ab ab abroad, no matter how bad it may look, no matter what horror may result, our government means well. Its intentions are honorable, even noble. And the, the great majority of Americans hold these beliefs very tightly. They, they just believe that we, that we mean well. Frances Fitzgerald in her classic study of education in the US, a high school education, wrote in summary, Quote, the, the United States has been a kind of, sal this is what people believe from their studies in our high school, the United States has been a kind of salvation army to the rest of the world. Throughout history, it, it has done little but dispense benefits to poor 
ignorant, and diseased countries. The U.S. always acts in a disinterested fashion, always from the highest of motives. It gave, never took, unquote. And Americans genuinely believe, wonder why the rest of the world can't see us that way. Even people who take part in the, anti, in the anti-war movement can hold these beliefs. They, they are marching to bring out that good America that, that they were taught to love, which they still love. They march to bring out this, the, the best in, in this America. And, and that's not, they're not exactly actually opposed to the policies. These Americans are very much like, uh, well, Charlie Brown falling for Lucy's football. Uh, no matter how many times they, they are lied to or fooled, they continue to believe the standard propaganda about U.S. foreign policies. They'll, these Americans are like the children of a, a mafia boss. They don't know what their father does for a living, and they don't care. They just love him. And, and they want, but they have to wonder why someone just threw a, a bomb through the living room window. This, this basic belief in America's goodness is very sim- similar to what we're taught about American exceptionalism. Let's just look at how exceptional how our foreign policy has been. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has, has won, attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments, most of which were democratically elected. Two, drop bombs on the people of more than 30 nations. Three, attempted to assassinate more than 50 foreign leaders. Four, attempted to suppress a a populist or nationalist movement in more than 30 countries. Five, grossly interfered in uh, the elections of more than 50 nations. And six, led the world in torture not only torture performed directly by Americans upon foreigners, but with Americans providing lessons in torture, manuals for torture, and being present to observe their students. All this is indeed exceptional. No other country in in all of history or all of the world has come close to a record of this kind. So we are indeed exceptional. So the next time you're up against a a stone wall and the person uh, ask that person what the U.S. would have to do to lose his support. Ask him what for him would be too, too much. Keep in mind that our homeland, our precious homeland, above all, seeks to dominate the world for economic reasons, ideological reasons, nationalist reasons, Christian reasons, and for the personal advancement of a whole slew of executives and officials whose careers are based on one war after another. And these people are not necessarily bad people. They're they're like the sociopath who doesn't care one way or the other or the other. But it's not the behavior of a decent normal human being, is it? Take the Middle East and South Asia. The people in those areas have suffered horribly 
because of Islamic fundamentalism. What they need desperately is a, a secular government which will honor and respect all religions. But do you know that from, from the, from the mid-1970s and through the 1990s, there were a number of such secular governments in, in those areas. And what happened to these governments? The U.S. government overthrew them all. First came Afghanistan, uh, which from, from the mid-70s until the, the late 80s had a, a secular government where women had full rights, believe it or not. In, in the, the women wore, wore miniskirts. Imagine that in, in Afghanistan, women in miniskirts. This government was overthrown by the, by the U.S. and it was gave rise to the Taliban. So keep that in mind the next time you hear an American official say, we have to remain in Afghanistan for the sake of the women. <laughs> After Afghanistan came Iraq, another secular society under Saddam Hussein. And the U.S. overthrew that government as well. And now the country is run by crazed and fanatical jihadists. And any woman not covered outside runs a serious risk. Next came Libya. Again, a secular country, nation under Muammar Gaddafi, who, like Saddam Hussein, had a, a tyrant side to himself, but he also had a, a, believe it or not, a rather benevolent side. Under, under Gaddafi, Libya had the highest standard of living in all of, of Africa, and he also was, was a champion of African rights. He helped to form the African Union, so he was not all totally the bad guy that we're taught now, but he, he, he dared to uh, not become a client state of the U.S. and he was overthrown. He offered his people free, free education and free health care too, by the way. Uh, in 2011, the U.S., with the help of NATO, bombed Libya every day for six months uh, until the whole thing collapsed, and Libya then also became a failed state full of crazy jihadists. So, so and after Libya came Syria. For, for, for four years now, we've been attempting to overthrow Syria, another secular government. And, and guess what? Syria is now also a playground of crazed fundamentalists and jihadists, with everyone's new favorite, the Islamic State. To this list, we can actually add Yugoslavia, which also was a secular, secular state, and the U.S. overthrew that government, which gave rise to, to a, an independent Kosovo full of crazy jihadists again. So the, the rise of the Islamic State owes a great deal to U.S. foreign policy. With, with the overthrow of all these governments and, and what came after them, it, it's no wonder that the Islamic State is running wild in the Middle East. And what, what did all these governments have in common that we overthrew? They all refused to be client states of Washington. They refused to be uh, subservient to the empire. In a word, they wanted to be independent. So what do American leaders think of their own record in this context? Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice could have been speaking for, for all of the members of this private club. She spoke about our foreign policy leaders when she wrote in 2000 that in the pursuit of the national security, the U.S. is no, long, no longer needed to be guided by, quote, 
notions of international law and norms of institutions like the United Nations because America was on the right side of history, unquote. Condoleezza Rice. Let me remind you of Daniel Ellsberg's comment about the Vietnam War. He said, it wasn't that we were on the wrong side. We were the wrong side. <laughs> so what should we do about the Islamic State, which we can see U.S. foreign policy gave rise to in a major way? We smashed the, opened the bomb door, and all the animals escaped, and, and we can't put them back in. We have to do something to combat ISIS, obviously, but when we fight Syria, well, in Syria, we must keep in mind a few important things. One, we, we, we have to watch for signs that this fighting is taking place not to overthrow ISIS, but to overthrow Assad of Syria. And two, we have to keep in mind the, the d civilian casualties of our bombing, what that would be. I think the Islamic State will actually die of its own weight. It's, it's, it's co already covered so much territory. It, it can't begin to, to govern that. Now, I, I, maybe I'm being overly optimistic. The huge number of people they need to run this whole, the entire Middle East almost, and it will c continue to create hatred of itself all, all over the area. Well, okay, I, I'm going to pause now, but uh, we'll talk later. Thank you very much. Hi, you're watching Voices of Resistance. Today's program is No to Endless Wars for Empire. Now, I've shown you two different speakers, Ryad Girard and William Bloom. And while they both are coming from very different perspectives and points of view, I think they represent two very strong voices of resistance who are speaking out and exposing these unjust and endless wars for empire. We need to say no to endless war for empire. Now, I know it's a far stretch, but when I hear people talk about what the solution should be, for Iraq, Afghanistan, the whole situation with ISIS in the Middle East, people always go, well, you know, there's just no easy solution. It's kind of complicated. And this reminds me a lot of what I hear people here in Hawaii say about the homeless situation. Because you can imagine, I am always talking to people and struggling to people about how outraged I am about the vicious attacks that the city and state continues to carry out against homeless people. Basically, we are making it a crime to be homeless. We are criminalizing the poor. We are criminalizing homelessness. And this is very evident when you watch these constant sweeps that the city and state continues to do these sweeps where they said, look at all this rubbish, and the city had to come in and get this much tons of rubbish, and we cleared it out so it can look all nice and clean. Well, they like to call it rubbish, and to some people it might be rubbish, but a lot of that is people's belongings. Frankly, it's all that a lot of people have. So when I struggle to people with people and they go, well, you know, you have to understand, I know it's not nice what's happening and what the city and the state is doing, but you know, there's just no easy solution. And there is some truth to that, that under the current system, that there isn't an easy solution to find these people adequate housing that they deserve. But I can tell you one thing, the solution is not to criminalize the poor. The solution is not to take homeless people and go in there and jack up all their belongings, to take their stuff, to impound their belongings, to scare children who are living in the vicinity. That is not the solution. And that is very clear and very evident to me. Just like when you look at the situation happening in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, you name it, wherever the U.S. is waging their war at the time and continues to wage war, you know, things are very complicated. There are a lot of different players involved. But as both speakers pointed out, one of the reasons things are so screwed up over there right now, one of the reasons that ISIS has gained such control and momentum is exactly because of the US, 
of what the U.S. has been doing for over 20 plus years in Iraq and other regions. That is why things are screwed up. So once again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at this picture and say, yeah, it is kind of complicated. I don't know what the immediate solution is. But I can tell you this, the solution is not to go in there and kill more people. The solution is not to bomb hospitals. The solution is not to continue drone assassinations where 90% of the people killed by these drone assassinations aren't even the people that they supposedly are intending to kill. The solution is not to keep troops in there. The solution is for the U.S. to get out. I can tell you that. So, I thought it was important to bring up these topics and to show you two important voices of resistance. And I hope people out there continue to speak out because you too should be a voice of resistance. So I'm Liz Reese and thank you for watching Voices of Resistance. The struggle continues. A war for order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls. A war on terror, a war on drugs, a war on kindness, a war on hugs. A war on birds and a war on bees. They got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. A war with jets and a war with missiles. A war with high seated government officials. Wall Street war on high finance. A war on people who just love to dance. A war on music, a war on speech, a war on teachers and the things they teach. A war for the last 500 years. A war's just messing up the atmosphere. A war on Muslims. A war on Jews, a war on Christians and Hindus A whole lot of people saying kill them all They got a war on Mumia, Abu Jamal The war on pop is a war that's fair A war that's filling up the nation's jails World War 1, 2, 3, and 4 Chemical weapons, biological war Bush War 1 and Bush War 2 They got a war for me, they got a war for you You can't stop it when the beat just drops